It's important to realize that cross-site scripting is really a category of attack, kind of like buffer overflows. It's not one singular attack. It's a type of injection. Like when you say SQL injection, which we'll look at here in a minute, or SQL, it's not one singular attack. It's a category. These are well-known, and you can use organizations like OWASP and download their prevention cheat sheet. So we have some good resources here. So if we look at this diagram, we have the hacker over on the far left-hand side. So what they're doing is they're infecting a victim's web page with a script. So typically the data gets into the web application using some untrusted source, like a, a web request, and the data is included in dynamic content. It gets sent to the web server, which is not validating. Now, historically, a hacker could choose from really three different types of XSS attacks. Stored XSS typically happens when the user input is stored on the target server, for example, in their backend database. It could also be in a log, visitor log, a comment field. It could be in a message forum. And then the victim retrieves the stored data from the web app without the data being cleaned before it's rendered in the browser. Stored XSS, by the way, is also referred to as persistent or type one. Then we have reflected XSS. This is when user input gets returned by the web app immediately in some search result or maybe an error message. Basically any type of response that has some or all of the input that the user provided in the request. And again, it's not being cleaned before it gets rendered in the browser. And that's non-persistent or type two. Type zero is referred to as DOM-based XSS. And this is where the entire corrupted data flow from the source to the server takes place in the browser. For example, the source of the data is in the DOM, the sync is in the DOM, and the data flow never actually leaves the browser. Now, today we really break up the cross-site scripting into two categories, server XSS, and client XSS. So we would say it's either server stored or server reflected or client stored or client reflected. There's plenty of tools out there that very easily allow you to form these types of scripts. Uh, they're already pre-formed and pre-made. They're in all the exploit kits. Let's take a look more importantly at some of the best ways to countermeasure this common type of attack against web servers and web clients. According to OWASP, you need a security encoding library. Never insert untrusted data except in allowed locations. And this is going to make more sense to web programmers and web server admins. Do an HTML escape before inserting untrusted data into the HTML element content. An attribute escape before inserting untrusted data into the HTML common attributes. And JavaScript escape before inserting untrusted data into JavaScript data values. Now, if you're wondering where I got that list from, here's where it came from. Okay, the OWASP cheat sheets, and this is the cross-site scripting prevention cheat sheet, and it's actually longer than a sheet, okay? But you can see some of the rules I listed for you. And if you're not a programmer or a web developer, they're not gonna make a lot of sense to you. However, this exam does not demand that you be a web developer or programmer. You can see there's prevention rules down here, and you can see some of the rules that I actually gave you, which was do a JavaScript escape before inserting untrusted data into the JavaScript data values. And you know, if it really gets right down to it, and I want you to come get this resource, of course, but if you were to break down defenses against server XSS and defenses against client XSS, if I could just give you one rule, okay, and it comes from this actual document, okay, on the server side, it basically comes down to letting untrusted data get put into the HTML response. So the easiest way to countermeasure that in most situations is to do what's called context sensitive server side output encoding. And that's why you need a security encoding library. On the client side, which is typically caused because untrusted data is used to update the DOM with an unsafe JavaScript call, the easiest and best defense would be use safe JavaScript appies. And that's also what OWASP is going to tell you as you go down through these rules. There's a lot of rules here because there are a lot of delivery systems or different vectors for XSS attacks. Now, while we're here, let's go search for XSS's cousin, 
the CSRF attack, which is the cross-site request forgery. And you can see we've also got a code review guide, testing guide for these vulnerabilities, and here's the CSRF prevention cheat sheet. Now the CSRF will be found obviously in websites, but you can also find this in Instant Messenger or a web browser that performs a illegal action on a trusted site where the user's already authenticated. So that's kind of the key thing to remember for this is that the user has already been authenticated. And this has been used to steal money, okay, change passwords, buy products by forging the user request, often without the knowledge of the target user. Maybe you've heard of a term called watering hole, where it's a particular type of website that certain categories of users congregate at, okay? So watering hole attacks are often a CSRF attack because these go after community type websites, you know, based on common webmail users or social networking, or they're gonna target really high value sites, banks, PayPal type services, online brokerage firms. For example, a classic CSRF attack was called the Sammy MySpace worm. So for prevention of CSRF, we're gonna take a few of the top things from this list. Determine the origin that the request is coming from or do source origin. Determine the origin the request is going to. Identify the target origin. Examine the HTTP request header value. If the origin header is not present, verify the host name and the refer header. Make sure it matches the target origin verifying that the two origins match. And finally, a commonly used method of preventing this is to check the referrer on embedded network devices. And so again, here's our cheat sheet. And our last takeaway is that cross-site scripting, even though it's a cousin to CSRF, it's not necessary for CSRF to work, but it can be used in combination with the attack. So keep that in mind. So going back to our diagram, the attacking site or the malicious user is leveraging the authenticated user's web browser and authenticated session. And again, that's a key thing that is a difference between CSRF and XSS. Even though we can use cross-site scripting techniques, more specifically server side, to conduct our CSRF attacks. Let's talk next about fuzzing and fault injection. This is something that you'll be expected to at least be able to identify on the exam. A fuzzer is a program that automatically injects semi-random data, okay, or pseudo-random data into a stack or a program looking for bugs. Mutation bugging is actually a hybrid that involves blindly changing the existing input values. We have debugging tools that are called generators, and they use combinations of static fuzzing, which are values that are known to be dangerous, or pseudo-random data. Some of the next generation fuzzers will actually use genetic algorithms to link injected data and observe the impact. As of the time of this recording, fall of 2017, these next generation fuzzers aren't public yet. And you can see a couple of examples here. You can do a SQL injection, cross-site scripting, you can force a crash, a hang, a denial of service. And the three methods that we primarily use to prevent these types of attacks is to implement fuzz testing to find weaknesses, use secure coding and project management principles, and consider deploying application layer firewalls, a next generation firewall from Cisco or Barracuda or Palo Alto Networks. Or you could use something like an appliance, like a Cisco web appliance or Cisco cloud web services to name a few. Web hijacking is also a very common tack out there where you have fake input controls that are positioned under the hijacked web controls. And then the user, of course, goes to their banking site. They put in their username and password, and then all of these clicks are hijacked by an invisible frame in the actual web page. And to the client, this is a transparent attack. Here we see kind of a step-by-step -step at the top, the customer's browser generates a request to a web server asking for a certain price on an item. That's in the HTTP request. The attacker's browser generates request to the web server asking for a price on an item, as well as all the customer's usernames and passwords. There's other hijacking attacks uh, that you might need to know about on the exam. Flick jacking, take advantage of you putting in the wrong URL into the address bar. 
Click jacking is also called user interface redress attack or UI redress, also called typo squatting. So they've registered, you know, domain names that are close to it, like Google, like, you know, instead of G-O-O, G-L-E, they'll get G-O-O-G-E-L or something like that. They'll find misspelled variants of domains, register that, and then they will have the exploit on that web server. Some other software vulnerabilities are unsecure direct object references, improper error and exception handling, vertical and horizontal privilege escalation once they get access to the system, and improperly storing sensitive data. In other words, unsecure backend servers. Because of the problems and issues with SQL, for example, you're seeing a lot of organizations get away from SQL and using what's called NoSQL or other types of unstructured databases like Hadoop and MongoDB. We can use firewalls for application visibility and control. So for example, here's on an adaptive security appliance, you can see that we're using an inspect map of HTTP. So over there on the left under inspect maps, we're creating an HTTP layer five through seven inspect map. And we're going in and we're gonna countermeasure our SQL injection attacks by building regular expressions that can match different patterns in the URI. So we have a regular expression builder and we can invoke that in our inspect map and we can look at this traffic as it comes through our firewall. Uh, so the ASA can do this or we can pass this off to some other appliance. Here we see a Cisco intrusion prevention service, okay, which could be a module or a standalone sensor which also has signatures in its database, which should be updated on a regular basis, at least once a week from the cloud, for different variants of SQL attacks and variants of CSRF attacks. And realize a lot of the exploits that we're dealing with are just variants of existing attacks, variants of existing vectors. Here we see the Cisco web security appliance. So we could offload our deep packet inspection for these types of attacks off of the firewall or off of our edge router to a virtual or physical appliance like the web security appliance from Cisco, or we could even use their cloud web services. And that's a very popular solution as well. Here we see a Palo Alto next generation firewall, which also has application security. It has vulnerability protection, denial of service protection, file blocking and their wildfire analysis tool from the cloud. So this next generation of firewall could also be used just as you could use Checkpoint or Barracuda. But Palo Alto is the next big competitor to Cisco. So from a price point standpoint and a single operating system standpoint, this might be a good option for you. And it's also gonna be using cloud-based analysis and regular updates from Palo Alto's cloud to countermeasure a wide variety of different attacks.